Thank you, and I, and I truly appreciate Dr. Coyne's uh, presentation. He, he took the hardest part of my talk and, and kind of summarized all those different things that are happening in the soil and all the different life that's in the soil. And, and I'll mention it one more time in my presentation just to reinforce how important it is to realize that we do have a living ecosystem in that soil and how important that ecosystem is in developing um, strong nutrient cycles in our grazing systems. So today I want to talk about things that we can do on, from a practical standpoint to build and enhance nutrient cycling within our grazing systems. When we look at agricultural production systems, probably the most sustainable system is, is a cow-calf system, a well-managed pasture. We're removing very few nutrients from that system, but what we are doing is recycling those nutrients within that system. And really, a well-managed pasture is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So today, I want to talk about several things, and, and I want to start out and just talk a little bit about soil, and then talk about some basic soil fertility principles that are important to understand so that you can build strong nutrient cycles in grazing systems. And I'll say right now that, that I don't subscribe to the thought process that you get something for nothing. In order to develop strong nutrient cycles in pastures, we have got to have a base level of soil fertility. That's very important. We can't take a few ounces of this product or that product and, and spray it on the soil and, and expect to have a strong nutrient cycle. We have got to start with a base level of soil fertility. And we'll talk about getting to that base level of soil fertility. Um, and we're going to talk about the role of grazing management in developing strong nutrient cycles and grazing systems. And then we'll talk about the ro role of legumes like clover and alfalfa in developing strong nitrogen cycles and grazing systems. And then the last thing I want to do is kind of give you an update on the Grain and Forage Center of Excellence that's being formed in western Kentucky at the University of Kentucky's Research and Education Center at Princeton. Uh, big things are happening there. And, and this organization is, is part of those big things that's happening at the research station. So I, I want to start out and just kind of define soil. And this is from a very classical soils text, uh, Brady and Weil. If you've ever had a um, soils course, chances are you use this text. And um, the way soil is defined is a dynamic natural body composed of mineral and organic solids, gases, liquids, in living organisms. Uh, and all these together serve as the medium for plant growth. And, and I put in green the living organisms because that's something we don't talk enough about. A lot of times when we talk about soil, we'll talk about sand, silt, and clay. Like soil, some kind of, of uh, static body that's not living. In reality, soil is teeming with life, especially a well-managed pasture soil. And this is kind of showing what Dr. Coyne's um, slide showed. This shows how much of these different organisms are in uh, a pasture, uh, acre of past healthy pasture. So if we look, for example, at um, plant roots, there's about 2,500 pounds of plant roots in an acre of healthy pasture. If we go down this and we look at bacteria and atenomycetes, there's about a ton of uh, bacteria and atenomycetes in an acre of healthy pasture. And if you look at fungi, there's about three tons of fungi in an um, acre of healthy pasture. And you can keep going down this, this list through nematodes and protozoa and mites. Earthworms are 625 pounds. When you add all these things up, and I was very happy that it came very close to your number, Dr. Coyne, we find about seven tons of living things in a healthy acre of pasture land. Just think about that for a minute. Think how small a bacteria is, and there's a ton of those per acre. I mean, it's really phenomenal when you think about this ecosystem that exists below the soil surface. And the last thing I just want to mention about this is that when we manage a pasture, we're not only managing the grass and the forage, we're also managing all these other things that are below the soil that we can't see. So what makes a good pasture soil? Deep, fertile, and well-drained. Does that describe most of our pasture soils? No. Usually we find this type of soil in row crops. Um, but ideally, that would be the best pasture soil that we could have. We want it to have a high nutrient and water holding capacity. 
We want, and that's going to be a, uh, a soil with medium texture. So a loamy type soil that has equal proportions of sand, silt, and clay is going to hold the most plant available water. Um, we want to have high organic matter. We want to be loose and poor, so not compacted, like Dr. Uh, Coyne was talking about. And we want to have that high biological activity. So all those things that we talked about, the, the earthworms and the protozoa and the nematodes and, and insects and so on, are all an important part of this biological activity within the soil. So, so how, do we, how do we assess the productivity of a soil? And there's two ways that we do that. One is what we call the soil productivity groupings. And this was developed by the NRCS a long time ago. And they rank soils from one to eight or nine. And um, one is the most productive, and then uh, eight or nine are, is less productive. And generally speaking, soils that are one to four are going to be our agricultural soils. When we drop to five or below, uh, those tend to be less productive and are found mostly in forestry type applications. The other way we assess soils is through soil testing. We can look at the chemical characteristics of those soils, things like pH and phosphorus and potassium and so on. This is just a uh, diagram showing the, the relative productivity of different uh, productivity groupings. So if we look at a, a grouping of one, and we have an alfalfa orchard grass mixture on it, we have the capability with good management to produce greater than six tons of forage per acre. If we drop down to a three, all of a sudden there's something inherently limiting about that soil in terms of productivity of that alfalfa and orchard grass mixture. And we have the potential to produce less than four tons of dry matter. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this to, to realize that if you have a more productive soil, then we really need to fine tune management and that soil has the potential to produce more, which means our fertility program should represent that. It should have a higher level of fertility on that better quality soil. And this also falls into our, our acres per animal unit. So this is the number of acres to carry one animal unit for the grazing season. As we get um, into these lower productivity soils, we need more acres of land to carry a given animal unit. So how do we figure out what soils we have? There's a, a great tool that's available on the web now called Web Soil Survey. And it's kind of replaced our paper soil surveys that many of you may remember that, those books that have the maps that fold out and you kind of find where your farm is. And, and then you um, kind of go to that map and try to figure out where it is. This is all online now. Um, this is the web address, but it's easier just to Google Web Soil Survey and it's going to bring this page up. And uh, there will be a set of simple directions that will allow you to put your address in. It'll take you to the general vicinity of your farm. And then you can actually use a little tool to draw a polygon around the field that you're interested in. And then it will tell you what soils you have. And it'll give you a, a plethora of information about those soils, how productive they are, what limitations they have, and so on. Um, if you're not comfortable using a computer, get with your local extension agent. They'll help you figure out what soils you have using this tool. Or stop in and see your local uh, soil and water conservation person, and they'll help you figure out what, um, what soils you have on your farm. So whenever I talk about um, soil fertility and nutrient cycling, I think one of the principles that we need to understand is, is uh, Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And basically what it says is that the Level of plant production can be no greater than that allowed by the most limiting of essential plant growth factors. Well, what's, what's that mean in plain English? There's lots of different things that impact plant growth and pastures. It could be fertility levels like potassium or nitrogen or phosphorus. It could be soil acidity. It could be temperature or moisture and, and many other things. Whichever one of these is the most limiting is going to hold back overall pasture productivity. And that's very important to understand. We can kind of think of that as a barrel. When this barrel is full, it represents 100% yield. Each one of these staves in this barrel is a, a different um, essential plant growth factor. Whichever stave is the lowest, no matter how much water we put in this barrel, we can never achieve our, our maximum yield. In this case, it's potassium. So when we identify that limiting essential plant growth factor, we need to correct that. And when we correct that, then we can fill that barrel up and achieve 100% yield. 
when we talk about soil fertility, we often mention things like indicator plants. And indicator plants are plants that tell you something about that soil where they're growing at. Um, it could be acid or it could be alkaline. It could be low in fertility or um, poorly drained or have a low water holding capacity or be compacted. And, and, and probably the best example that we see all over the countryside this time of year is broom straw. And um, broom sage is, is indicative of something that's not quite right in that soil. And uh, a lot of times people will say, well, the soil needs lime, it's too acidic. And, and that could be true, but in many cases I find that it's more closely related to phosphorus concentration in that soil. So it doesn't have enough phosphorus fertilizer. But it's indicating that something's not quite right. But instead of using indicator plants, I, I like to tell people to use a, a soil test. And what we want to do is quantify the nutrients in that soil. A soil test is going to look at not just nutrients, but also soil acidity. We're going to look at phosphorus and potash, but not nitrogen. Nitrogen is highly mobile in the soil, so we don't have a good test for measuring that and making accurate recommendations. Instead, what we do is make recommendations for the immediate need of that crop. Um, and soil testing provides a baseline. Otherwise, we're just kind of guessing at our soil fertility program. And it allows us to really target fertilizer application. So it allows us to identify that nutrient that is limiting overall pasture production and allows us to correct that nutrient. And just a little bit on soil sampling pastures. Important thing to remember is to avoid atypical areas. And what do I mean by atypical areas? So those are areas that where animals concentrate themselves. Shade sources, water sources, maybe where we fed hay at, uh, where a mineral feeder was. Anywhere where animals were concentrated, they're going to tend to, to elevate the nutrients or concentrate nutrients there through dung and uh, urine deposition. And if we take a, a soil probe there, we're going to get an... an high reading on our soil test um, that's not representative of the entire pasture. We want to have at least 20 cores in our sample, and we want our samples to represent less than 20 acres. It's very important to remember when we're soil testing, we're taking a handful of soil, and if we're sampling 20 acres with that handful of soil, we're trying to represent 20 times 2 million or 40 million pounds of soil. And so it's very important that we get a representative sample of that pasture and we avoid these atypical areas. Generally speaking, we want our soil testing uh, depth to be about uh, three to four inches. And then we want to sample every two to three years and kind of track the fertility in our pastures over time. I just want to mention soil acidity because it's a major factor limiting forage production in the southeastern United States. And, um, we, it causes a couple things to happen. It reduces nutrient availability within pastures. So we're negatively impacting how available those nutrients are to plants. And it also reduces nitrogen fixation in legumes. And, and Ray had a great picture of that when we started uh, just uh, this afternoon of the alfalfa that was not very productive because nitrogen fixation was not optimized because of low pH. Um, so liming neutralizes soil acidity. It also reduces calcium, uh, supplies calcium and magnesium to plants and pastures. And, and when we look at general guidelines, most of our pastures are grass and clover, and we want to be between 6 and 6.4 in terms of soil pH. That's our optimal range. If we're getting down close to 6, we're going to want to put a little bit of fertilizer on to bring it back up to about 6.4. So this is the impact that soil pH has on nutrient availability. If you look at this graph, this is over here is a pH of 4. This is acid. On this side is a pH of 10. That's alkaline. And these are different nutrients represented here. And, and the width of this band, so how wide this band is, represents how available that plant nutrient, that nutrient is to a plant at a given pH. So when we start to look at this range of six to seven, what we see is that's where the bands of the most important macronutrients are the widest. That means they're the most plant available. And so things like nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and calcium and magnesium and sulfur are, are all the most plant available when we're between six and seven in terms of um, soil pH. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this so that you understand that 
if, if you take a soil test and your soil test calls for lime, you're going to get the most bang for your dollar by applying that lime because you're making all the other nutrients in the soil more plant available. So that's the first thing that you should put on if your soil test is calling for lime. Uh, this is the yield response to fertilization. On, on the x-axis or the bottom axis, we have different soil test levels. So we go from low fertility to high fertility. On the y-axis, we have yield response. And, and what I want to show you is that when we're in this very low and low range, when we put nutrients on to supply the nutrient that's deficient, we get a very big yield response. And, and, um, and as we get into the medium range, this yield response diminishes. So this is the law of diminishing returns. And by the time we get to the high range, we get no more yield response or increase in yield from a given nutrient. So where do we want to be? Ideally, we would want to be right between medium plus and high minus. So we're supplying enough nutrient, we're not oversupplying it, and we're, we're not getting any more yield uh, suppression from that given nutrient. In reality, if we can be in the medium soil test range, we may lose a little bit of yield towards the, the bottom of the medium range, but really, um, we're probably not greatly limiting yield. So we want to be at medium or above in terms of soil fertility, and then we can feel pretty confident that we're not limiting yield with that particular nutrient. Now, one of the most beautiful things about cow-calf systems is that very few nutrients are removed once we build them up within that system. So if we look at a cow-calf system, we have inputs coming in in the form of fertilizer, manure, legumes that are fixing nitrogen from the air and bringing it into the system. Feed and mineral sources are all bringing nutrients into this system. And then they get cycled around within this system. So the cows eat the forage and then the, nutrient, the forage is digested and the nutrients are digested back onto the pasture in the form of dung and urine. About 80 to 90% of the nutrients that go in the front end of the animal come out the back end of the animal. So we're removing very few nutrients from this grazing, a well-managed grazing system. When we look at exports, what we export from a grazing system is calves and, and uh, once in a while a call cow, hopefully not too, too often. And if we look at the estimated nutrient removal from a cow-calf pair, we're removing uh, 10 pounds of nitrogen, we're removing 7 pounds of phosphate, in one pound of potash. If we put this on a per acre basis, if we're stocked at two acres per calf-calf unit, we're removing less than five pounds of nitrogen. We're removing three and a half pounds of phosphorus and less than a half a pound of potash a year. So very few nutrients are being taken away from a well-managed cow-calf system. Now it's important to understand that you have to make that initial investment in nutrients to build your nutrient levels up. But once you build these nutrient levels up with good management, we're removing very few nutrients. What can happen in a grazing system is that we can redistribute nutrients. So if we have one large continuously grazed pasture, our animals are coming out here and they're grazing, and then they go back to get some shade and, and have a little bit of water to drink, and, and they lay down and they ruminate, and, and then they get hungry again and they get up. What happens when they get up? It's like going to the bank, they make a deposit, right? And, and over time, what happens is that we transport nutrients from here into our shade and water sources um, where animals lounge at. And, and we tend to concentrate nutrients in this area. So what do we do about that? Well, this is where rotational stocking comes in. We can subdivide these pastures. We can take these animals and we can put them in this small area and say, go ahead and graze, and then go ahead and deposit your, your nutrients back in this paddock and then we move them to the next one, and we move them to the next one, we move them to the next one, and so on, and we rotate the animals around this system. The more paddocks that we make, and the smaller those paddocks are, the more uniform the nutrient distribution will be within the grazing system. Now, one of the soil fertility principles I think it's important to understand when we talk about cow-calf systems is the amount of nutrients removed by hay. Um, unlike grazing systems, we can remove a tremendous amount of nutrients in hay. For example, if we take orchard grass hay, these are, this is the pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium removed in one ton of hay. 
We're going to remove about 50 pounds of nitrogen. We're going to remove about 15 pounds of uh, phosphate and about 60 pounds of potash in one ton of hay. So just think about that for one minute. Say you had a good year and you yielded three tons of orchard grass per acre. Well, if you do the math on this, all of a sudden we're removing about 45 pounds of phosphate and around 180 pounds of potash. When we're removing this level of nutrients, it doesn't take long to draw nutrient levels down in hay fields. The point that I want to make is that if we're taking hay off of a pasture or off of a hay field, somehow we've got to get these nutrients back onto that field. And usually that's going to be an application of either an organic fertilizer source like broiler litter or an inorganic source like N, P, and K going back onto that pasture. But we can't continue drawing nutrients off and expect this field to remain productive. Just this week, someone came in and said, you know, I have this Bermuda grass stand, and it's been extremely productive, but the last year and a half, it just has not produced much. I said, well, let's look at your soil fertility levels. And, and what happened was he drew his, phosphor, his potash down to the very low range. And, and that means that that potash, that low level of potash, was limiting his overall production in that field. The point I want to make with this is if you're making hay, you've got to put those nutrients back. There's no free lunch here. So what's the value of those nutrients in a ton of hay? And, and we have to make some assumptions, and this is the assumptions on how much nutrients the hay contains. This is the value of the different nutrients um, from, from this fall. And if we do the math on this, and you can do it when you go home if you want to, one ton of hay has about $35 worth of nutrients in it. Why am I telling you this? I'm, I'm telling you this because if you're not a, a huge operator, sometimes it makes more sense to buy hay in. And when you buy hay in, you get the feed value of the hay, plus it's kind of like getting a coupon for the nutrients that you're bringing back into your grazing system. Um, and that's about $35 of nutrients per ton. Now, how you feed that hay can impact how those nutrients are distributed within the grazing system. Generally speaking, uh, we can move nutrients from outside of our grazing system if we purchase hay and bring those nutrients in with that hay. Or we can even move nutrients around our grazing system. So say you were on an old dairy farm, and we tend to concentrate nutrients around where the cows were on the dairy farm. Um, so we'll tend to have high phosphorus and potash levels in those areas. Um, we could produce hay on those areas and then take that hay farther out on the farm and feed them on paddocks that have a low concentration of phosphorus and potassium. And by doing that, we can actually move nutrients from one part of the farm to the other. We will always want to feed hay on our porous pastures, so those pastures that need a little bit more organic matter or need nutrients. Um, and then we want to move our feeding points around. So it doesn't do you much good if you bring those nutrients in, but you put all the hay in one place and feed it all in one place. The nutrients are going to be concentrated there. What you really want to do is move those feeding points around that pasture, whether you roll it out on a hillside or whether you um, use a, a ring to feed the bale or have a bale wagon. Somehow you want to move those points around to get a better nutrient distribution within that pasture. One thing that I want to mention about nutrients, bringing nutrients in in terms of hay, is that it's not like buying commercial fertilizer. It's going to take a lot longer to build up soil fertility by, by bringing hay in and expecting it to supply a lot of nutrients. If you're really in need of, of nutrients, your best source is going to be a commercial fertilizer source to quickly build uh, fertility up. All right, I want to talk just a little bit about the role of grazing management in developing strong nutrient cycles on um, cow-calf operations. The first thing I want to mention is that we've got to set a sustainable stocking rate. And, and stocking rate is the number of animals over the entire year. And um, what this graph shows us on the bottom or the x-axis here, we have stocking rate. So this is the number of animals per acre. And as we move this way, it, it's increasing. And then we have animal output here. And we have two types of animal output. We have the solid line on this graph, which is output per unit land area. And then the, the individual animal output, which is the dotted line. 
So generally speaking, when we have a low stocking rate is when we're going to have the highest individual animal performance, right? So they're not having to look very hard for food here. So we're going to have high individual animal performance. As we increase our stocking rate, this decreases. The thing about a low stocking rate is that we have low output per unit of land area. So this system is not really sustainable because we're not producing very much because we're stocked too light. So as we increase stocking rate, we're going to increase animal output per unit area and decrease individual animal performance. Where we want to be is where those two lines cross at. That's our best compromise between output per unit of land area and individual animal performance. We don't have optimum individual animal performance, but it's not bad. But, we, but we're producing quite a bit of, of beef per acre at this stocking rate. And this is what we call our optimal zone, this blue area. Now, when we increase our stocking rate past this optimal zone, what happens is the whole system crashes and burns. We have decreased individual animal performance, and then we have decreased overall performance of the whole system or output per unit area. So we need to be set a sustainable stocking rate. And everybody's saying, well, what's that sustainable stocking rate? In, in, in my experience, and it's going to depend on your soil type, it's going to depend on your forages, and it's going to depend on your, your management skills and, and your soil fertility. Um, but in my experience, in, in states like Virginia and Kentucky, we're going to be somewhere between two acres and three acres per cow-calf unit. And um, if you're just starting out and, and you want to make sure that you have enough forage to extend your grazing season a little bit, you know, you should really be starting closer to three acres per cow calf unit. As your management skills improve, as your nutrient cycles increase with good grazing management and good soil fertility, then you can start to um, increase your stocking rate a little bit. So I want to talk just a little bit about rotational stocking. And, and what rotational stocking does is it allows us to do two things. It allows us to, to um, determine how close that pasture is grazed, so how much residual leaf area is left in that pasture. And the second thing it allows us to do is rest pastures between grazing events. Both of those are very important in terms of pasture productivity and maintaining a healthy and vigorous sod. Generally speaking, at, when we switch from continuous stocking to rotational stocking, we increase pasture productivity and we increase drought tolerance of that pasture. That's not often realized, but one of the things that people notice when they switch from a continuous to a rotational stocking system is that pastures grow longer into to a drought stress and come out of that drought stress faster. And we're going to talk about why that happens in a few slides. The first thing I wanted to mention was productivity. This was a summary that was done by Lynn Sollenberger at the University of Florida. And he went back through the literature and he looked at studies that compared rotational stocking and uh, continuous stocking. And he looked at the advantage in percent of using uh, rotational stocking over um, continuous stocking. And, and it varied some, but on average, this red bar is the average, uh, we increase productivity by 30% when we switch from a continuous to rotational stocking system. And that's about right. In my experience, we increase productivity by about a third when we switch from a, a rot continuous stocking system to a rotational stocking system. This, this was an article that I wrote for, and, and I don't like to quote myself, but, but Carrie, Carrie Brown did a good job of pulling this out. This was in the Cow Country News that was... Um, an article on getting started with rotational stocking. And, and you can tell from this quote that I'm a slow learner. So it says, after almost two decades of attending uh, and teaching grazing schools, it finally dawned on me, we, we make rotational stocking too hard. And there's a lot of truth in that statement. You know, we get up in front of you at a grazing school or, or an NRCS meeting or wherever and tell you that you need to install miles of fence and that you need to install miles of water lines and, and, um, and frost-free waters and so on and so forth. And, and by the time we get done saying that, everybody is so scared, they say, whoa, whoa, whoa that's too much for me. You know, I don't want that. In reality, you, everybody in this room can probably implement a rotational stocking system today just by closing a few gates on your farm. Um, most of us have three or four sub to big subdivisions on the farm. If we just close our gates and start to rotate the animals through those big subdivisions, 
as we start to see the benefits of that, then maybe we want to install a water or we want to install another fence here or there or a lane or an alley. But, but we make it too hard from the beginning. So if you can do one thing when you go home, just close some gates and, and start to let some pastures rest between grazing events. Whenever we talk about grazing management and rotational stocking, I always like to talk a little bit about forage plant growth and grazing management. And, um, and I like to start with photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the most single most important biochemical process on Earth. Without photosynthesis, none of us would be sitting here today um, in this lecture. And it takes light energy from the sun and goes through a series of steps and converts it into chemical energy through the plant. And it uses this, this equation, carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil is converted into sugars and carbohydrates in the plant. And an important byproduct of photosynthesis for us is oxygen. This all takes place in a specialized part of the plant cell called the chloroplast. And the whole, the whole process is driven with light energy from the sun. I like to think of, of our farm as a big solar panel. And, and what we're doing as, as grazers and, and managers of our farm is managing this solar panel. So the closer we graze a pasture, the smaller that solar panel becomes. And uh, as that solar panel becomes smaller, it's going to take longer for that pasture to regrow and recover after that grazing event. So what we're doing with rotational stocking is we're saying, you've grazed close enough. We want to maintain some size on this solar panel. We're going to move you to the next paddock. And we're making the decisions for our, for our animals. Here's a defoliation event taking place. And I apologize, that's not a horse. I mean, not a cow. That's a horse, my wife's horse. And I am a horse owner by marriage. And um, so if we've got adequate water and we've got adequate fertility in the soil, what do we need for this plant to regrow with? And, and the answer is the same for anything that we do. Any kind of work that we do, we need energy. And that energy comes from two places when we talk about pasture grasses. It comes from leaf area remaining after grazing, so that solar panel. So by not grazing too close, we make that solar panel bigger. And it comes from stored carbohydrates in the plant. So those are, sure, those are um, sugars and, and carbohydrates that are stored up that can be mobilized to supply energy for regrowth and maintenance of the plant. After a stress period like a drought, or after defoliation, uh, like a grazing event takes place. Now, different plants store their carbohydrates in different places. And, and uh, does it matter where they store their carbohydrates? Kind of, because it's going to impact how we manage that plant under grazing. For example, if we look at a tall grass like orchard grass or tall fescue, they store their carbohydrates in the stem base, so that that, that bottom part of the, the the tiller above the soil, that stem base. And so what happens when we graze that plant really close? We remove all the photosynthetic panel, right? And then we get down into that stem base and we start to remove its store carbohydrates. How fast do you think that plant's going to regrow after we, gra after we graze it closely? It's going to be slower because we put kind of the double whammy on that plant. We removed its ability to capture sunlight through photosynthesis because we grazed the leaf area off and we removed the energy that has stored up in the form of carbohydrates because we grazed that stem base. Something like white clover has a modified stem called a stolon that grows right along the soil surface. So that's safely below the grazing height of the animal. And that's one of the reasons that white clover will persist under close and frequent grazing better than orchard grass or tall fescue will. I just wanted to mention real quick about what, what's happening underground as we graze the top of that plant. And this is really important to understand. Um, this was a, a study that was done by a guy named Kreider in the 1950s. And it's an old study, but it's still very applicable. If we look at um, removing 50% of the shoot, so if we had a, a grass stand that was 10 inches tall and we grazed five inches of, the, five inches of it off, we temporarily, for a short period, stopped root growth. If we had a single defoliation event where we removed 90% of the top of the plant, so if we had 10 inches, we removed 9 inches, we stopped root growth for 17 days in that plant. If we clipped that plant off three times a week, root growth never resumed. That's what we would find in a continuously stocked pasture, so every time that 
plant tries to regrow a little bit, the animal's right there and says, boy, that looks good, and grazes the top of that plant off. And, and that compromises the root system of that plant. When we remove 40% or less of the shoots, root growth then stop. The point that I want you to take home from this slide is that what we do to the top of the plant impacts what's below the soil surface, and that can have a dramatic impact on the drought tolerance of pastures. So we've got two plants here, one that's continuously stocked and then the second one that's rotationally stocked. Look at the difference in the size of the root system. Which one of those plants are gonna grow longer into a drought stress? The one with the bigger root system, right? It's got the ability to find water in the soil because of that larger root system. One of the benefits of rotational stocking that we don't talk enough about is that we increase the drought tolerance of grazing systems by how we manage the top of that plant because it's impacting what's below the soil surface. All right, I want to talk real quickly about the role of legumes in grazing systems. And, um, and, and uh, Dr. Coyne talked a little bit about nitrogen fixation. Generally speaking, nitrogen it, it can be limiting, is most often limiting in grazing systems. It's highly mobile in the soil. The nutrient nitrogen is highly mobile in the soil, so it's easily lost. What legumes do is they fix nitrogen from the air. So the air we're breathing today is 78% nitrogen. But that nitrogen is not available to the plant for growth. What the legume does is form a symbiotic relationship uh, with rhizobium bacteria. So the rhizobium bacteria forms nodules on the root system. This is a kind of a housing structure for this plant. And the plant gives those rhizobium bacteria a place to live in a, an energy source in the, in the form of sucrose. In return, those nitrogen have developed a method of taking this nitrogen gas in the air, converting it into a plant available form and sharing it with that legume plant. So both of those entities are getting something out. It's a symbiotic relationship. So we can increase yields when we add legumes to grazing systems. We can improve forage quality and in turn animal performance. And if we choose legumes with deep tap roots, something like alfalfa or red clover, we tend to improve summer growth in these pastures. And then very important for us is we tend to dilute the endophyte in tall fescue. So we make the endophyte not as bad if we have a good component of legumes in our stands. It's not a solution, but it's, it's kind of a management strategy. But what's even more interesting was Michael Fleiss, um, uh, presentation last year, when we look at a legume like white clover, it has compounds that actually reverse vasoconstriction in the animal. So vasoconstriction is what happens when animals consume endophyte infected tall fescue and the ergovalene causes the vascular system of the animal to constrict and gives that animal a fever. There's actually compounds in red clover that reverse that effect. So this is... Um, what I want you to take away from this table is that different legumes have the ability to fix different quantities of nitrogen with alfalfa being our most aggressive nitrogen fixer and annual lespedeza is one of our lower nitrogen fixers. What's important to remember about nitrogen fixation in legumes is that it's not directly shared with the grass. So the, the legume plant doesn't say, here, here, have some of my nitrogen to the grass plant and just give it to it. It has to be indirectly shared, and it's indirectly shared through the grazing animal. So the grazing animal will eat that clover plant, and then it will go through its digestive tract and come out as dung and urine. And, and that nitrogen is shared through the deposition of dung and urine on that pasture and other microorganisms that help break that dung and urine down. It's also shared indirectly through death and decomposition of plant parts, which include leaves, roots, shoots, nodules, that break down in the soil and all those things that Dr. Coyne talked about, all those microorganisms and, and um, things like earthworms and insects and dung beetles, they all are participating in breaking these roots and shoots down and sharing that nitrogen so that the grass plant can take it up through its root system. Very limited direct transfer of, of uh, nitrogen from a, a legume plant to a grass plant. 
So what do we do in terms of legumes? What we really need to be thinking about is how do we manage our pastures to increase the prevalence of legumes? Dr. Blazer was a forage scientist at, at Virginia Tech for a long, long time. He was retired when I came, but he used to talk about managing pastures for legumes. He says you should always be thinking about managing that pasture for legumes, not the grass, but the legume component. And so what do we do? We want that legume to make up 20 to 30 percent of the sward. If we have it at that level in the sward, then we don't need to put commercial fertilizer on that grass stand. So we lime and fertilizer according to soil tests. We want to create an environment in which that legume will thrive. Generally speaking, our improved legumes like red clover, white clover, and alfalfa like higher levels of soil fertility. We want to avoid nitrogen fertilization. When we fertilize a mixed stand of grasses and legumes, we tend to shift that botanical composition away from the legume towards the grass. We tend to favor the grass with that nitrogen fertilization. We want to overseed legumes when they start to, to play out in our pastures in late winter. Six to eight pounds of red clover, one to two pounds of an improved white clover, like a Ladino white clover, um, is, is a good mixture. Some years we can put a little annual espadiza in. It just depends on the cost of the seed. Last year was not the year to put annual espadiza in. It was about $3 a pound, um, so it was too expensive. If it was 75 cents a pound, then you might consider putting a little bit of annual espadiza in. And then we want to rotationally stock our pastures. And, and one of the powerful things about rotational stocking is that we can use grazing management to, to manipulate the botanical composition of our pastures. And this is a nice example. This is an alfalfa orchard grass mixture. Now, if we graze this mixture closer, we tend to favor the alfalfa plant in this mixture. And the reason why is that the grass is dependent upon its solar panel or leaf area left after grazing and store carbohydrates. So when we graze that grass plant closer, we tend to remove or make that solar panel smaller so it doesn't have the same amount of leaf area to, to carry out photosynthesis. And we tend to remove a few of the um, store carbohydrates in the stem base. Now in the, the opposite is alfalfa. Alfalfa has all of its carbohydrates stored in the taproot of the plant. So when we graze this close, it doesn't bother the alfalfa as much because it just mobilizes the store carbohydrates from the taproot and uh, promotes growth. So close grazing followed by rest period will tend to favor alfalfa. And if you want to favor the grass in this mixture, you raise your grazing height. So we're leaving more leaf area on that grass and that tends to favor the grass in that mixture. Grazing management is really a powerful tool in terms of manipulating botanical composition within pastures. All right, so here's my checklist for building strong nutrient cycles. We want to set a sustainable stocking rate. We want to lime and fertilizer according to soil tests. We want to rotationally stock our pastures. We want to manage for legumes. And when needed, we want to overseed our pastures with, with additional legumes. And, and I'll just, this is the last um, slide for this part of the presentation. And I just want you to remember that in today's society, we like things that are instantaneous. I don't like to call people and leave a message anymore. And I know that's a terrible thing to say, but, but I want to talk to somebody when I call them. You know, I want them to answer their cell phone. And, and I think we've, we've gotten this sense of everything has to come instantaneously. In developing strong nutrient cycles in pastures is not instantaneous. It takes three to five grazing seasons to really, uh, to, to really make measurable change from man pasture management. So it's important to realize that we've got to kind of set our objectives. We've got to figure out what we want to do. We've got to implement those practices and then we need to be patient. And in three to five years, we're going to see really big things happen in terms of improved nutrient cycles within grazing systems. I just wanted to finish up real quick with a couple slides on this, the Grain and Forage Center of Excellence. If you haven't heard about this, this is an initiative that's taking place at the University of Kentucky's Research and Education Center in the western part of the state uh, near Princeton. The purpose of the Center for, uh, of Excellence is to help Kentucky farmers feed the world sustainably, protect the environment, expand the Kentucky economy, and, and allow those farmers to pass those farms on to the next generation. Um, 
The Kentucky Agricultural Development Board awarded the University of Kentucky a grant for $15 million to uh, renovate and expand the research station. And we have lots of different partners in this, and the Kentucky Cattlemen is one of these partners. And we certainly appreciate each and one of the, every one of these partners uh, in the Center of Excellence. Probably the biggest thing to happen with the Center of Excellence uh, lately has been the donation of a million dollars from the Kentucky Farm Bureau. And, and we certainly appreciate this donation, and we, we appreciate that the Kentucky Farm Bureau has, has made this investment long-term investment in the future of agriculture in, uh, in Kentucky. So we're, we're undergoing now a, not only a physical expansion of the research station, but also a renovation of the main office and laboratory spaces. We've actually added 300 acres of an adjacent farmland to the research station, and we're getting ready in, April, in March to start our, our major renovation of the uh, office facility and laboratory spaces. This is what it's going to look like when we're finished. We're adding more meeting space. We're adding some smart classrooms, more office space, and then we're renovating and adding more laboratory space to expand uh, the impact that this research station can have in terms of applied research for producers um, in Kentucky. This is just some architectural uh, renderings of what the research, of what the station will look like when uh, we're finished with the renovation. And while the, the, the physical expansion of the research station and the, and the renovations are exciting, what's really exciting is what the college is doing now, and that's investing in young faculty at the research station. We're at a point at the research station where we have a lot of our, our older faculty members who have been there for 30 or 40 years are retiring, and, and they're replacing them with young and aggressive faculty members. And these aren't people that we're finding along the street these are some of the best and brightest young researchers um, in the country, and they're doing applied research that's going to support Kentucky agriculture well into the future. So it's quite an exciting time to be there. Now, in September, we're losing a key faculty member at the research station, and that's Dr. Roy Burris. Dr. Burris is our animal scientist at the research station, and after more than three decades of uh, service to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, he will be retiring. This is a key position for the forage and livestock program at the research station. And I would encourage you to take the time, if, if this is an important position to you, and contact the College of Agriculture and, and tell them that this is an important position. Um, our college appreciates grassroots support, and, and they, they will take your comments very seriously. That's all I have, guys. Is there any questions? How do I do on time, Jimmy?